Um, uh, thanks. <laughs> I won't have time in half an hour to really go in all the details of IMH reconstruction, but it's also not the point of that. The point after this is that you should be able to associate some of the objects you have in the code, in the surf code, with the kind of what it means in, in, the, in the MRI world, right? So kind of link between the MRI physics and then the objects which we have, which you can then use for the image reconstruction in the, in the surf code. So um, how many of you actually have done some MRI reconstruction before? Can you raise your hands? OK, great. Um, so the, the basic idea of, of MRI is that um, so we have this machine which um, does all the, all, all the heavy work, and then we put an object inside. And what it basically does is that um, what we get out of, of the MRI machine is something which we call K-space. Um, the K is just something people came up with. It doesn't actually have too much meaning. Um, but what it is is a, a representation in frequency space, so also a Fourier space um, of the actual object. And um, this encoding is basically done inside the machine. We'll get to that in a, in a little bit. And then, of course, we'll briefly discuss this because you need to understand a little bit about that in order to understand then how we get from the case space then to an image space to the object we actually want to have. Right? Um, so, actually, thanks. Um, the, a brief overview of what's happening inside the machine when we go from some kind of object in image space to the case space. Um, we need basically three different things. And the nice thing about uh, MRI is that these three things are actually in the name of MRI. So MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And the first bit, uh, magnetic, um, is basically because we need a magnetic field, right? Um, so this machine is basically just one huge big magnet. And um, what happens if we put an object inside is that um, all of us have lots of water, and which includes hydrogen in the body. And these hydrogen nuclei, they orient themselves in the field and they produce some kind of, yeah, some, some magnetization, the macroscopic magnetization which we can measure. So an important thing to remember about MRI is that is what we measure is always the sum of everything which produces a signal inside of our magnet. So if you just put a body inside, there's no spatial information. We get one 1D one signal out of there if we do some measurements. Um, then the, the second part is the resonance. Um, that means that if we put the object inside, then we have an equilibrium state. Everybody knows an equilibrium state doesn't give out any information. We need to probe this um, state, and that's what we call excitation. Um, so we have uh, basically this static magnetic field, which can be 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, 7 Tesla, but also a higher one for human imaging. If we look for animal, animal imaging, of course, you have even higher field strength, like 9.4 and 11 Tesla and so on. Okay? Most commonly used is probably 1.5. Um, three Tesla, and there are a few facilities which do seven Tesla, and since recently, there's also seven Tesla machines which actually are C-labeled, so they can be used for patient imaging now. Um, and so in order to basically get some signal out of there, we have all these, um, these um, nuclear spins in there. We basically, we give them a little bit of energy. We perturb the equilibrium state, and of course, if we do this really short, it's, we call this a pulse, or radio frequency pulse because the energy of this, what we need, is in a radio frequency range. And um, if we give this short impulse, basically, we perturb the equilibrium state and then the system goes back. And going back into equilibrium state, they of course have to put the energy we put in, they have to give some energy out again, and this is what we measure. Okay? Um, it, what we, this is kind of shown here, so usually it's magnetization, so that's the sum of all these spins. It's uh, oriented along the B0 direction, so that's the orientation of my magnetic field. And if I then apply an RF pulse, then I perturb this state, so the magnetization gets deviated from this um, main um, direction, and then it goes back. It doesn't go back straight, but it goes along the spiral, um, but it's not so important. And um, what I then can do is I can pick up the signal with an RF coil. So I put some RF energy in, I perturb the state, and then I can also the signal comes out is also a radio frequency signal again. And in theory, I can um, acquire the signal with the same coil which I used in order to put the RF signal in. But we'll get to the signal reception a little bit later. Okay. Um, and then the last bit is the imaging bit. As I said before, what we measure is the sum of all the spins. So there is no spatial information. So what we need to do is we need to encode this spatial information into the signal. And if we have a radio frequency signal, well, there are basically two options what we can have. 
we can change the phase of our signal, we can see the frequency of our signal. And this is what we do with additional coils. So these are like um, uh, three different coils for the three spatial direction. And with these coils, we can slightly change our magnetic field. So it's a little bit indicated here, it's a bit small. Um, but basically, um, the main magnetic field, as I mentioned, is the range of a Tesla or three Tesla or something like that. And then we have these um, gradient coils, which we can put small um, gradient fields on. So fields which vary over space. And then the range of like millitesla. So it's very, very small change. But this is enough in order to slightly change the frequency and the phase of our signals, depending on the spatial location. This is how we get the information in there. Um, the disadvantage of this step is this last thing that we have to do encoding is why MRI is so, so slow. Because we have to basically encode one point after the other. And we'll get to, to that also in, in a little bit. So these are basically the three things which we need. Once we have got all of this in place, we acquire our case space, which is up here, and then we can do our um, imagery construction. So um, as I mentioned before, the, the object which we have here, we put in the, in, the, in, the, in the MRI machine, and of course we get our case space signal. Um, but of course we don't get like a continuous case space, but we can only acquire discrete points. This is done by these gradients here. So we acquire different points. Um, this means that, um, which we also get to in a little bit later, we have to carefully think of how we place these points in order to be able to reconstruct the proper image. But on the other hand, it gives us lots of freedom because um, these points here where we acquire them basically just depends on the gradient fields here and the gradients just uh, depend on um, what voltage I put on this or what, what current I run through the coils. And so it's very flexible. So in theory, we can acquire any points here as we want in any order which we want, which gives us a lot of freedom. So some of you might have heard that um, also over the last two days, but people talk about Cartesian sampling. So that means like something like this. We have nice parallel lines. And it's all on a rectangular uh, grid. But you can have also radial sampling where you have then radial lines going through or spirals or even like some kind of random sampling. Usually not always possible, but um, to a certain degree. Okay. Also, if you have any questions or is anything unclear, just interrupt me, okay? And if we do this Cartesian encoding, um, then everything is just in rectangular grid, and that's very easy for us to reconstruct because then it's basically just a fast Fourier transform, okay? In all other cases, if this is not the case, if it is not a, a Cartesian case, or if there are things missing, then it's not so easy. But in principle, that's the relationship between the two. There's also an advantage of, of MRI because um, when, we, when MRI basically started, because of course the fast Fourier transform is, as the name suggests, really fast. So this direct reconstruction is also really quick on an MRI machine and produces, for a wide range of different applications, very good images. Okay. Um, so how does the encoding work? Um, so as I mentioned before, when we put the object inside the scanner, we have this equilibrium state, so we need to perturb that. So that's this RF pulse up here. It's this short energy which I sent into the, the, the object. And then, of course, I need to encode it. So this is a K space and um, a 2D K space where I have basic KX and KY here. So there's two dimensions for a 2D image. And here I have then two gradients which help me to move around in this K space. So whenever I apply some, some gradient here, then so if I have the RF pulse, I start basically in the K space center where there's basically everything is the same. So there's no encoding. As soon as I put on these gradients, I start to move around in K space. So if I have this gradient in, in, in uh, y direction, then I basically move down in k-space here. And depending on the amplitude here, or basically the air under this curve, depends how far I go. Then I put another gradient on in x direction, which means then I move in this way, for example. And then I do the actual readout, so when I actually acquire a signal, um, which is then shown here. So I have another gradient here where I basically go back along this line. This is how I uh, acquire a line. Um, if I want to now go to the second line, I basically have to repeat that um, and select a different phase encoding step, so less amplitude here, and I only go a little bit down here and then acquire another line. Um, so what you can see here basically, and that will be important then for the imagery construction, is that um, in a way we have two different time scales here. So um, acquiring all these points here along this line is quite quick because that happens during the time of this gradient. Here we are talking basically like less than like a millisecond or something, okay? But then going from this line to the next line is quite complex because I have to repeat this entire cascade here. So if I want to acquire this line, I can acquire 100 points here, but if I go one step up here in the, in the y direction, 
I basically have to do my excitation again. I have to do my phase encoding to go down there. I have to do this to go to this point, and then I can actually acquire. And so the parameter which, which describes that is the so-called repetition time. So the time it takes in order to repeat one acquisition. And the total time, of course, then depends on how many lines I want to acquire here. So the total acquisition time is ny, the number of lines, times the repetition time. Okay? Um, and, um, the, and that's why when, when we talk about MI reconstruction, we usually um, take the smallest, the smallest unit of our acquired data is hence usually one of these lines. So not one point here, not one point acquisition, but a full line. Because in a way, we can assume that the acquisition of one of these lines is instantaneous because it's a very short time frame compared to the total acquisition. Okay? As I said, this is like less than a millisecond. TI is usually in the range, if it's really fast, it's four or five milliseconds. So there's a huge difference between those. Okay? Um, in now kind of the, the surf, um, uh, in, in the surf environment, we refer to the case space as it's it's an acquisition data object that contains the acquired case space, which we have. And as I mentioned before, in this acquisition data, we have a list of acquisition objects, and one acquisition object is one of these um, case space lines along the X direction. Usually it's referred to as readout or frequency encoding um, line. Depends a little bit also on the vendor. Okay. Um, one thing is that, um, which you will also, I think, maybe in, in, in the exercises then come across is that it turns out there's not just one, one readout, but actually a couple of those. Because as I mentioned before, in theory, when we excite, we use the so-called body coil. That's a huge RF, or well, huge coil in the magnet to excite your spins. And we can acquire also the signal coming then back, which we then use to create the image with this body coil. But usually we don't do that. We use like kind of local coils. Now we'll get why we do that in, in a second. And um, because all of these local receive coils, um, of course, get the same sig or get the signal at the same time from one readout, we hence put all the signals from all the coils in, in basically one uh, acquisition object. Okay? So this acquisition is not just one readout, but it's one readout per receive coil or receive channel, also referred to sometimes. Okay? Um, so this is then kind of what it looks in the code. So we have this acquisition data. And um, once we basically provide it with a raw data file from the MRI scanner, um, we can then access um, several parameters. And you will play around with that later. It's just um, a few examples where you can get this number of readouts, or you can do some sorting and some. So there, there's already quite a lot of functionality implemented, which lets you manipulate the case-based data, inspect it, see what you acquired, but also totally change some things in there. OK? Now, the question is, um, as I mentioned before, we can basically move around in our case with the acquisition as we want. So the, so the question, of course, is how should we move around in order to get the best image quality? And um, there are basically two things which we have to keep in mind. So here you can see our case-based data. Um, I, I call this the resolution. So it's basically the distance delta k between two neighboring um, encoding points. And then the range is going from, usually described as from minus kmax to plus kmax, so the highest frequencies. And then image space, so what you can actually see here is a, a coronary artery. Um, so up here you have the chest wall. Um, this thing here is the aorta. And this is the left coronary artery, just branching off from the, from the aorta um, when the blood basically comes out of the, of the um, heart. So the coronary artery is the vessels going around the heart. These are the first vessels which get the oxygen-rich blood coming from the heart. It makes sense that the heart tries to maintain its function um, as, as early as possible. And what you can basically see here is this branching off of all the different vessels which then go around the heart to, um, to supply the heart muscle with oxygen. And this is a reformat, so of course they, not, they don't lie all in a nice um, plane, um, but it was reformatted to cover the entire um, um, vessel tree. Um, usually here we also speak of resolution of our, the size of our, uh, of our voxels or pixels. And then um, the size of our image is usually referred to as the field of view. So it's the area which we want to encode. Yeah. Then there are basically two, um, two so-called sampling theorems, um, which are based on a Nyquist sampling theorem. So Nyquist sampling describes if I have a, a signal, how do I need to encode it in frequency? Um, or how do I need to have my sampling frequency in order to correctly encode it? And that leads to basically two equations. 
The first one is that if I have a certain field of view, then uh, my delta k has to be basically, or the field of view is defined by one over my um, delta k in k space. So the closer together my points in k space, the larger my field of view here. Okay. Um, the second one is that um, the, the um, resolution, my delta x in image space is given by um, the highest um, frequency in my, in my k space, which makes a little bit of sense because if you think of that the frequency representation of my object, then the higher the frequency here, so the higher the variation, the more detailed structures I can um, encode in from my image. Okay. Um, that also, of course, means that um, if I or we, we get, we'll have we'll have a look in a second um, what what happens when um, when these things are are not fulfilled. But basically, if, if what people usually do at the MRI scanner is that I plan my field of view, I want a certain resolution, and based on that then these encoding parameters of my case space get calculated and then they are filled in a um, sequential manner until I have all the data required. Okay. Um, here's an example of what happens if um, we don't fulfill these requirements. So you can see here is that um, in the starting with the same image from before, so we filled our case space to the highest frequencies as desired. If we now take smaller parts, so we don't sample as high frequencies, you can see you just lose the details. That's basically what it does, right? So if you don't have enough high frequencies, you cannot encode these sharp transitions um, of small details, and hence you um, lose some, uh, some of your resolution. So you get basically a blurry image. Mm. More interestingly is then what happens if we don't fulfill the field of view requirements. So what you have here is again your case space. Um, Change the winding a little bit so you can see it better. And um, here I just normalized the delta k to one. So it's one over field of view actually. And um, uh, then I can basically cover my entire field of view. If I now leave out every second line, so I increase the distance between acquired um, k-space lines, then I you get this kind of effect. So with this encoding, I can only cover this field of view. But of course my object is much larger. And so my encoding is not, um, not unique anymore and I get these basically copies of my object which are shifted to each other, but on top of each other. And these are the kind of the standard MRI artifacts which are also referred to as aliasing or the undersampling artifacts. Okay. Um, the, of course it gets more extreme if I increase my distance even more by a factor now four for example and I get four copies of my object um, they all shifted to each other. So here the shift is called field of view half, and here's then uh, field of view fourth, um, one half, and three fourths uh, of the field of view. Okay. Um, the, what you can also see is here the way this undersampling is done is always um, that it's only along one direction. That kind of goes back to what I said before is that we have this kind of two different time scales. So on the one hand, I have this really fast acquisition along one reader, the one frequency encoding line. So it doesn't really make sense to undersample in this direction. I don't really gain any much time. It doesn't make my scan faster if I leave out every second point because the acquisition is so fast anyway. Where you can usually gain scan time to make my scan faster if I reduce the number of phase encoding steps so the KY um, encoding in this direction. Okay, so I have the frequency encoding and readout which is the fast one and this is the kind of the smallest unit which we have in our case space. And the second direction is called phase encoding direction um, which is then the slow one where I have to keep repeating the entire um, sequence so where the timing between those is the repetition time. Yeah. And so when we do undersampling, we always do it along um, the phase encoding direction. And if I have a 3D volume, so this is all 2D images, um, but um, if I have a 3D volume, then of course I have another phase encoding direction along the Z direction. And then I can do also 2D undersampling because then I have the, the Y and the Z direction to do some undersampling pattern, which then um, yeah, can make it more interesting. Are there any questions about that so far? Um, I'm sure that during the, the last talks you have then um, often heard um, people speaking about um, when you do some undersampling, they still can get out actually good images, which is usually um, referred to as parallel imaging. And um, this is what we're gonna discuss a little bit now. So um, I mentioned to you already that in theory we can use the body coil to acquire data, but usually we don't do that. We use so-called local receiver coils, um, which look something like this. 
This is your MRI machine, and the body coil is basically integrated in here. So roughly where this white ring here is, this is where your body coil is. Um, and this is what we use for the excitation, so for determining the equilibrium state. But then we have all these local receiver coils which are targeted for certain anatomies which we use for signal reception. So here you can see, for example, different head coils. And um, basically one element is something like this here, right? And so you have multiple of these receiver coils all the way around the head. This would be something for the, for the heart or the chest. And here you see kind of the extreme bit. If you want to do full body imaging, you would cover the entire patient basically with something like this. Okay? Um, so the first question is, why do we do that? And um, this goes back to what I said at the very beginning, that in MRI, um, we always measure the sum of everything which we have excited. So we do our excitation pulse. And all the spins, all the hydrogen nuclide, all give signal back. Um, so which means that if I have a huge um, so body coil, which sees everything, because I excited everything, then all of these, of course, will also contribute as noise. Right? Um, and if I have um, some, uh, but I might not actually be interested in, in, in all of this, but might be just interested in the heart or the head or so on and so forth. So what I can do is I can use some smaller receiver coils which don't see everything, but have a locally kind of or spatially reduced um, sensitivity area. And hence, I only see signal from the area which I'm interested in. Of course, having just one of these small ones wouldn't give me a nice coverage. So you usually have multiple of these ones. And depending on how I, what I acquire, so one advantage in MRI, I don't have to acquire just a transversal plane, but I can arbitrarily move my plane around uh, as I want, or have a 2D volume or whatever. And, um, which calls are used for signal reception and depends just how I plan my scan. So if I um, do a transversal slice, I might use different calls for reception than if I have a coronal slice, for example. Okay? And the main advantage is that um, I, on the one hand, I get less noise because I see a smaller volume, but then I also have, um, of course, multiple receivers. So I, get, I measure more or less, I measure the same object um, multiple times. And of course, the noise in all of this different is uncorrelated. So if I combine them, I get an improvement in SNR. That was the main idea why people um, invented that. And then later it turned out that um, when we use these calls, actually we start to get spatial information in MRI signal. Because of course, if I have this signal up here, it only sees this area. I know that if I have a signal from this coil, it can only be within this field of view. So I have a much smaller field of view than the entire body, for example. And I can use this additional um, spatial information in order to improve my imagery construction. And we get um, to that at the, at the end of, of, of my talk today. Um, so the big challenge now is if I think of a slice here through the head, then I get all these different images. Um, and you can see now that dif depending on where our, our coil was, of course, I can see different parts of, the, of my head. Now the question is, well, I don't want this for diagnostic purposes, right? That would be a bit annoying. What I want, I want an image which is nicely homogeneous and covers everything I'm interested in. I don't want to look at six, seven different images which always just show me a part of the brain. So the question is, how do we combine those? Um, and the easiest uh, um, to do, and this is also one of the exercises you're going to do today, is just um, sum them up. Well, sum up the squares of, of these images, okay? So that's kind of shown here. So I get these images from these four different coils, and I just sum them up, and I get something like this. That's the easiest way because I don't need any additional information. Just need the data from the different coils, and that's enough. Um, but um, that's kind of um, not the optimal way because um, it depends a little bit on the coils. So for head coils, usually not a problem, but for body coils, um, because they can have different relations to each other. They are, of course, optimized, but um, it's not necessarily that if I just sum all the images up, I will get a nicely homogeneous image because it depends to, of the orientation of the coils to each other um, and um, also a little bit on the, on the body composition of what they actually see. So another approach is to actually determine, sorry, determine, um, no, it's not what I want to. Um, is to determine the so-called um, sensitivities of my receiver coils. 
that I refer to sometimes coil sensitivities. Um, so I tried to determine kind of the, the area which each of these coils are sensitive to and which each of these coils sees. Um, there are different ways of how I can do that. Um, so one is either from the data itself. So if I have here, for example, these images, then I can do the sum of squares. And then I can, it still contains, of course, anatomical information. So I want to get rid of that and just keep the sensitivity. Then I can basically divide each coil by the sum of squares and I get something like this. And then I usually smooth it and filter it to make sure that also in areas where I don't have any signal, I get also reliable coils. Um, but another option is, which actually the, the gives you better results, if you don't calculate from the sum of squares of these coils, but actually acquire an additional image of the body coil. But of course, you don't have to acquire a high resolution image because that would basically double your scan time because you have to do another scan, but it's enough to acquire a very low resolution image. And that um, depends a little bit on the vendor what is done. So um, in, in certain scanners, you go this approach where you acquire basically some, some, some additional, some low resolution images in the data. In other vendors, they actually acquire body coil image um, before the scan in order to make sure you get very nicely homogeneous um, coil sensitivities. And then, yeah, you do some, some, you can see here, for example, this ring around where the, where the bone is, right? And this gets then smoothed out and um, extrapolated. Important thing is here, um, of course, if you have any artifacts in the image, then they get translated into your coils and then translated into image reconstruction. So you have to make sure that whatever you do in your coil maps, that you have a high quality there because these artifacts will translate directly into your image reconstruction. So once I have that, then I can basically compensate for these coil sensitivities by multiplying with the um, complex conjugate of the, for each coil and then divide again by the um, sum of squares of my coil sensitivities. You can see in this example, for example, in the brain, you can see there was some shady area up here because this coils was not optimally tuned um, to the other three um, coils. And this is gone now here because you're compensating for that. Okay. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind here is that um, if we do all of that, um, we are combining data from different coils and then we have these sensitivities. Um, so it's not, um, you have to be careful of, of how you analyze the images here. And so you have to keep in mind what you have been doing to an image if you want to analyze it. Because if you now try to calculate a signal to noise ratio here, for example, it might not be homogeneous about, over your image. Because um, each of these, um, uh, each of these weighting factors, for example, they can also change then um, where you are, depending on, of course, how the signal is here in the center, for example, it can also mean that it's different here in the center than the outskirt where you have higher sensitivities of all your calls. Okay? So if you do some an analysis of your image, you always have to keep in mind all the processing steps which, which have happened um, to make sure that the values actually calculated here have actually any meaning. Um, in SURF, this is um, um, a method for calculating the cause sensitivity is implemented. Um, so again, we have an object which is called cause sensitivity data. Um, put some case-based data in there, and then we can have just an option to, to calculate our um, coil maps that's shown here. And there are some parameters which you can set in order to um, determine what the calculation is supposed to be doing. So one parameter is, for example, the smoothness. So I told you in order to make sure that they are spatially um, very smooth, you can also add some smoothness constraint here when you calculate that. Okay, so um, it's basically just um, two or three lines of code and then you get your call maps out of there. Yeah. Mm. Um, so now we had basically the, the data acquisition with the acquisition data and then the call maps. As I said, initially the call maps or the, this um, different receiver calls were uh, designed in order to improve your SNR. The idea that I have multiple receiver calls, noise is not correlated, object signal is correlated, so I improve my SNR. But um, quite quickly, people um, realized that actually we can make use of this additional spatial encoding information which we have in there. So this is the kind of the uh, a signal equation for, for MRI. Um, so basically here you have your case-based signal, this one here. The X here is your object. And then here you have this um, uh, Fourier encoding term, which is just determined by the gradient which I employ. Um, and then additionally, if I have this cause, I have this spatially varying cause sensitivities. And in the end, what I do is I sum over, the, of course, the entire volume, which I excite, and then I get a case space for each of these coils. And then there are two kind of um, ways of looking at this problem. Um, one is, which you might have heard also in the last two days, is so-called SENSE, which means sensitivity encoding. 
which regards this problem as, well, it just means basically that I do a standard Fourier encoding of multiple images which are weighted by the sensitivities. And so they basically then reconstruct images for the different coils um, and um, then kind of try to optimize the, the combination of these images in image space. Okay, and it turns out that um, if I, uh, even if I leave out data, so if they're undersampled and I have undersampling artifacts, what we saw before of these multiple copies of my object overlay onto each other, um, by having this additional spatial encoding here, I can basically remove that under some, con um, some constraints out of the image data. But all of this is done in image space. The other approach, which I will go into more detail here, is so-called Grappa, um, which does the problem in case space, because what they see the problem as, well, it just means that I have a standard image but I changed my Fourier encoding, okay? It's just two different ways of looking at the problem. In the end, it's the same. You get similar results, not the same, but similar results. Um, and um, what this means is here, if I have a multiplication um, here in my Fourier encoding, it means nothing else that it's a convolution here in K-space, right? That's simple um, for um, theory. So. The idea here is that um, if I have again here my, my image and here my call sensitivity, well, that means nothing else as it's my case space for my original image, but then convolve the Fourier transform of this um, call sensitivity here. Yeah? Now, uh, convolution, um, in, in, um, uh, convolution here just means that if I take a point, then information from these points get distributed to the points around, depending on the width of my convolution kernel. Right? And so the idea of Grappa is now, well, if information from this point is located in all these points here, then it must be possible to not measure, <laughs> it's only like champagne, but yeah. um, if I don't measure this point, I should be able to get the information of this point from the surrounding points, because in some way, the information of this point is encoded in this uh, surrounding point. Okay? Of course, the question is then, how to determine these errors here, right? Um, so I need to know that. So this is kind of um, shown here again. So I have a fully sampled case space. Then I leave out every second line. So I have an unassembling factor of two. So I'm basically missing all these um, white circles here. And now I'm using information from all the different coils in order to fill that in. So what I can do is basically I can say, well, I take um, this region here. And what I want is I want to combine these um, six case space points and from these I want to calculate what value should be put in here. So I fill in the missing points based on the surrounding points which I have acquired. Yeah. Um, as I don't just have one coil but I have multiple coils, I try to find all these weighting factors which determine this value. Because in the end, all coils see the same object, right? <laughs> They're coding it differently but it's still the same object. And so all the information should be contained in these different coils. The only thing I need to figure out is how do I need to combine these surrounding points in order to correctly fill in the missing point? So that's the tricky bit of the, about the, the, the Grappa approach. So here's kind of the reconstruction formula, which means that if I have a K space at a certain Kx, Ky position, it's nothing else as a, some kind of weighting factor multiplied with the surrounding K space points, which are then one step or how many steps away from that. So depending how large you make this um, interpolation kernel here, depends how many of these points you use. For computational reason, people usually use um, as few points around here as possible, otherwise the problem is just too big. Now, of course, how to determine these um, combination factors. Um, we need to basically do some calibration. We need to figure them out. And um, the option which usually done is that um, we acquire... Get some music again. Um, that... Sure. <laughs> um, that um, in the center of, of our case space, we acquire some kind of reference data. So here we acquire some points um, where basically we have a fully sampled case, and then we can use that in order to figure out these, um, these, um, these um, weighting factors. Okay? Because we can now, based on these ones, we can calculate how would we need to combine that in order to get that value. And this combination, of course, the kernel is the same over the entire case space. We can then use that in order to fill in all the, the rest of the objects, which we are missing, okay? Um, so just a, a, a summary, a little bit of what we need to do is, so we have the signal equation. We need to first determine the so-called uh, kernel grappa. These are these weighting factors. Then we fill in the missing case space information. Then we get that image for each coil again. 
And then we need to combine that to get one um, the diagnostic image. So that sounds like a lot of work and quite complicated, but luckily enough, um, that's all basically implemented. Um, so here you have another object which is called the Cartesian Grapper Reconstructor, um, which you will also use later. And um, it basically just gives it your, your case-based data and has all the information about the, which lines were acquired for reference for the calibration, which lines were missing, which lines were acquired. And so um, there's nothing you need to do. It will all figure it out by itself. Then it will calculate the scrapper kernel. It will fill in the missing case-based data. It will combine the images to the final image. And then you can also get some additional information about the performance of your reconstruction. As I told you before, you can't really do the standard SNR measurement where you just look at a single point if you want to assess the image information. But actually, you need a kind of 2D SNR map of your image to see how the, the reconstruction went. Actually, not SNR because what you see in this map is not really the noise, but it's actually the the noise or the artifact introduced by the reconstruction, by the fact that you're missing some data and you're filling in data, which of course is never perfect. Yeah. yeah. So you, if I got this right, you can only do grubber if you've got multiple coils, is that right? So you need yes. from coils, otherwise it's just they'll pose problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So all this, both grubber and sense, all of these parallel imaging techniques rely on the fact that I have um, multiple calls seeing the same object, and then I'm trying to combine this information in the best way to get rid of any undersampling artifact. So, any other questions about that? Is yeah. Common in the hospitals? Yes. Having the multiple games? Yeah. So, um, there are, in clinical practice, I don't think there's any acquisition which would not be done with using multiple receiver calls. Hence, you have all the ones which are specialized ones. So you also have ones for like your shoulder or knee and so on. And um, Sense and Grappa are also, depends a little bit on the vendor, how they implement it, and if both of them implement it, but they're the most common forms of acceleration. So most scans will also use one, or the two, or one of the, the two methods. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? That is just one coil, right? And the, the second one is the one inside. No, um, sorry, the, the coils, yeah, it's a bit, I wasn't accurate in my terminology. So um, the, this, these coils you put on, they have multiple receive elements. Um, so even if, if uh, or even if in the head coil, for example, you had basically, you have like kind of this rectangular, um, multiple rectangular receivers, which are all the way around your, your head, for example. And here at the body, you would have small elements which look something like this. So, um, I don't know, in the head, commonly you would use maybe like eight receive channels, but they go up to 32, and there's some experimental ones, like even 64 receiver channels. And um, for the heart, for example, often you would use uh, 32 receive channels, so six in at the front and six in at the back. And then you have like, yeah, multiple combinations of other ones. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, um, now we come to the, to the last bit. And this is now kind of um, trying to formulate this um, MRR single equation or the reconstruction problem in a more abstract way. So what I showed you before is if I have quite everything, I can use the fast Fourier transform. I don't have to worry about anything, except for maybe how to combine my images. To do this undersampling factor of two, I have this very special grapper reconstruction. This is very um, uh, targeted towards solving this kind of problem. But of course, I can just um, formulate my, pro my problem as a standard um, inverse problem. So here again, I have the signal equation which we had before. And now what I do is basically I can just um, rewrite that with a, um, in a single um, uh, linear equation. So I have my case-based data, my image data, and what we usually refer to as kind of this operator here is the encoding operator. That includes anything which happens inside the MRI machine in order to code my object into my case space, okay? So in there, everything which you have up here, so the Fourier encoding, the coil maps, everything is contained in this um, encoding operator. And of course, once I have this very simple, um, um, very simple um, equation, I can just use, for example, L2 minimization in order to solve that. Usually in MRI, we use an L2 minimization because the noise, which I didn't add here now, um, is um, Gaussian, it's Gaussian complex, but still Gaussian. And so an L2 minimization is here um, usually the, the best choice in order to solve that. Um, of course, if I have um, 
this um, um, minimization problem, I can add additional regularization terms, like a, a standard like Tikhonov or a total variation. Um, and, um, but this is not, yeah, basically not done in clinical practice. So in clinical practice, um, we either use a, the fast Fourier transform or sense and grupper because the advantage of sense and grupper for parallel imaging means it's a direct method in the sense that there's no, I don't need any iterations or anything. So I have a direct um, formula where I just need to basically calculate my weights and then I fill in my case and then I do a Fourier transform again. So there are no basically tuning parameters. Um, compressed sensing was introduced in MRI maybe eight, nine years ago. Um, only now do vendors start to put that on their machines, basically because we have some kind of tuning parameters there, even simple ones like the number of iterations, for example. Um, that's very difficult in, in clinical practice to implement. Um, one thing maybe which I, I forgot to mention at the beginning is um, I told you that we have this um, the excitation and then the magnetization which we which we image, and um, the the kind of the thing which is quite unique or very specific to MRI is that the data which we acquire, so our case-based data, is not real valued, but it's actually complex. So it has not just a magnitude, but also has a phase. Um, most of the time, this just comes from the fact that um, the body also interacts with the magnetic field. We have these multiple receiver cores, which also have quite a different phase because that helps with the reconstruction then. Um, but in some cases also we can use the phase in MRI to encode information. Um, so um, if uh, one, one example, for example, is um, blood flow measurements. So with MRI we can acquire basically the blood flow velocity in whatever meters per second in three or four Ds so over a cardiac cycle with MRI. It's the only method which can uh, actually quantify the blood flow non-invasively. Um, and this information about the blood flow velocities is encoded into the face of my signal. And then in the image reconstruction is encoded then um, also again in the face of my image and so I need to preserve that. So both the data I acquire plus the image I reconstruct are complex valued. That can make some reconstruction problems also a bit challenging. So you also have to keep that in mind. So also when you do all your exercises, when you ever visualize that, keep in mind that you have to either look at the real and imaginary part or you have to do the absolute and face if you want to um, visualize the data. Um, now I just want to, um, to, to show you with some images at the end um, what, what, what um, some kind of examples of, of MR image reconstruction from, from my work, what I was did. Um, so what you can see here is that um, uh, is a heart and there's a real-time acquisition. So you can see the heartbeat, but you can also see that the heart moves up and down because of the breathing. This is not a Cartesian acquisition, but the radial acquisition. You can see all these radial artifacts and the encoding changes basically over the entire acquisition. That's why this artifact um, is high frequency here. And what you can see here is just a time curve where you can see this um, small changes is the heartbeat and then this larger changes the respiratory motion of the heart. Right? And then we can do um, an iterative reconstruction. That's something like rubber and, and sense, so parallel imaging. But because it's radial, it's not so easy to just fill in the missing points. You have to also have an iterative reconstruction where you basically solve also this the L2 norm, or minimize the L2 norm of the problem. Then you get um, uh, quite a lot of improvement already. So that's basically just for a transform and then combining the cores and here you use the call information or to get rid of some of the artifacts. And then you can also use some additional regularizations such as total variation to clean up your image. So here we have the total variation over time, for example, which gets rid of, of, of a lot of these artifacts. And this is just a 2D acquisition uh, yeah, 2D acquisition, but you can also do it in 3D. So here's an example again of a 3D encoding. Again, the beating heart, but no respiratory motion. And here's then with a total variation regularized reconstruction. Um, so these methods um, do make sense and do help a lot, but there's a lot of things you need to um, keep in mind for that. Um, in, uh, in SURF, again, um, these things are um, to a certain extent already implemented. So we have an acquisition model object, and this now is what we refer to in MRI as the encoding um, operator. So that it, again contains all the information about the acquisition. It has then two parts. So the one end we have a forward operator, which means I go from my image to my case space, and then it's the backward operator, which means I go from my case space to my image. So I have both ways implemented there. 
And with these two tools, you should be able to then basically um, formulate any iterative reconstruction problem and also add any regularization to that because you don't really have to know what happens inside. So you don't have to really know about all the coil maps and sensitivities. All of that is done inside the operator and you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, so that's just a summary of kind of what I tried to cover today and give a bit of MR background to those. And now when um, Johannes takes over now for the practical thing, then um, you will actually use these objects and play around with them and see what they actually do. And then so, but also if, if you do that and you have any more questions or later, then please just come and find me and ask me again about these things. Okay. Are there any more questions now? Or are you all eager to start working with SURF? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.